I hope that it was good. Now we enter into a world where moviegoers generate tens of billions of dollars of revenue a year. Tim Defoe stands to discuss digital cinema security. I was hoping for intro like that. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back from lunch and uh, glad you're at B-Size 2020 this year. Uh, my name is Tim Defoe, I'm presenting on digital cinema security and I wanna get into some of why I'm interested in this. It's a personal interest. Um, this is a opinions are my own sort of good faith talk that I wanna get into some of the security and some of the interesting parts of this. I have a lot of experience in standards bodies for security. So this is part of why I have an interest in this. And what I'm really hoping you'll take away from this talk is that when it comes to um, big asset values and <clears throat> security solutions are starting to get in the realm of hardware. When you're starting to get away from the trust and some kinds of other sorts of security, um, these are some examples I think you can really learn from and take something away from. So in terms of the scope of this talk, uh, I had to necessarily limit it because most of these topics are a talk in and of themselves. This forensic marking, you could have a talk on that for an hour. So let me talk about digital cinema and the transition to it and the DCP format, some of the security that's built into that and get about what is a DCP and how they're made. Um, so in terms of DRM, we'll be talking about that. And obviously this talk is also not a pro or con on DM, DRM. This is just a technology talk. So in terms of film as an asset, the thing I want you to take away here is that um, film became a business asset very quickly uh, in terms of the formation of the industry. Obviously, film is a cultural aspect, uh, sorry, asset and a, a phenomenon, but um, it very quickly became a business. And you can see right here in terms of like the asset values, you know, Jaws being the first domestic box office smash to beat 100 million and then to go on to more. Um, and then the global box office uh, grab last year being two, sorry, $42.5 billion. So this is a very um, still new and growing industry, but it's a very profitable industry. And now they're facing the transition between those old 35 millimeter assets to digital assets. We're in the D cinema, digital cinema era now. So this is something that started around the, you know, 1999, 2001. I think Jurassic Park 3 may have been the first digital only premiere. So um, we're still kind of new here and you can see the difference even in the film festival circuit that five years made at Con. Um, this took off very quickly. And it did so because there was very clear business goals. They wanted to meet or exceed their liability 35 millimeter and change the way they're distributing films and you know get into some different lo levels of projection. So the issue that we face as security people though, and that the industry has faced is that digital formats come with all the digital security challenges that we're used to. And when we're talking about asset values like these, those challenges are no joke. Um, we're talking about, um, you know, when Dark Knight came out and it was a very big deal because it was a 200 plus million budget. It was, a, you know, broke 1 billion at the box office. And now we're looking at the sort of Marvel universe. We're looking at the kind of, um, you know, lifetime growth, something like Endgame might see. So if you think about the asset values you've protected in your work, you can probably contrast it and compare it to what you're seeing here and see that this is a serious security problem. Um, and they're also up against um, profoundly patient and persistent interested adversaries. So traditionally, um, how the film industry has done their physical security, their operational security um, in, in protecting you know, their post houses. Um, these are some of the things they've done for a long time. They did it with film. Um, and some of the things are well known, but some of them are interesting, like the code names. Um, if you work at a post house and Avengers Endgame is in your post house, you don't run around talking about Endgame in the hallway all day. You talk about Mary Lou, you use a code name. Um, you think it's made me physically label with a code name. So there's things that they do to just keep things on the down low and compartmentalize. Um, they're also subject to audit. All these production consortiums and uh, you know, alliances and uh, associations have the right to audit. They can make sure your facility security is where it needs to be um, to do the kind of work and deal with these assets that they have. And also comes down to trust and reputation. Um, film can be a small community and there are expectations about trust and integrity. If you're a, a VFX house that loses a movie every one you know, year or two, guess what you're not doing in two or three years, being a VFX house anymore. Um, trust and reputation goes a long way, but there's also ways to do trust in the digital world we'll get into. Um, physical controls over a film is something that's been happening for a long time. This has always existed, but now we're in the digital cinema era. And instead of locking up a film canister, now we're taking around what's called the DCP, which is basically a hard drive in an enclosure. Uh, it's a crew drive enclosure. Um, they're EXT3 formatted, um, specific inode size, and they're transported around in Pelican cases. 
I don't want to get too much into this side of it, though, because it's a great talk from DEF CON 16 that Mike Renlin gave. And I think if this interests in you in the sort of projection booth and the theater side, check out his talk. What I want to get into is the DCP format. So the DCP format is the digital cinema package. Um, the best way to describe a DCP is the content delivery package for digital cinema. This is a thing that goes from the post house when they do their distribution master, the DCDM, package it up and get it to a theater so they can display it and show it and we can go see it. Um, in terms of what comprises a DCP, what constitutes it, it's basically a mix of XML and a format called MXF. MXF is an exchange format. It's basically wrapping your encapsulation. If you looked at the header and footer design, it would remind you of a lot of protocols and a lot of file formats. Um, but it's used to just generically wrap um, different kinds of media essence in terms of sound and picture. Um, and yes, it has an RFC. Someone from PBS actually submitted this RFC in 2006. And there's different kinds of DCPs. There's interop, which is basically the original version when digital cinema got started in those early days. Um, and then there's a newer format called Cinti DCP, and I'll get into some of the differences later. Um, there's a very complex naming convention for DCPs. Um, and it's it's Amazing how much information and meta you can convey in just a name. And this, uh, the Inner Society Digital Cinema Forum um, is the people that uh, codify and uh, um, standardize on these names. And finally, once the DCP is created in, in this crew drive, you transport it via physical media. You can transport it via USB, um, and sometimes uh, they are transmitted via satellite. So here is what a crew drive looks like. It is an enclosure, it's lockable, it's ruggedized. The, the back pins, uh, I think they have a insertion, um, mean time between failure, about 30,000 in, in, uh, insertions into a media server. So these are pretty burly little things. And this is the standard enclosure for uh, digital cinema. And if you wanna see how ruggedized it is, if you have um, any knowledge of what a cage code is or what an NSN number is, you'll see two DX115s here. Um, crew has been playing in other markets for some time in terms of ruggedized gear, and this speaks to that. And as you can see here, digital cinema is universally loved and no one has any problems with every, you know, movies living on hard drives. Everyone thinks it's a great idea. Um, there's no controversy at all. And I think that the best way here to, to celebrate our friend Quentin and the, the death of all cinema is to build our own DCP. So that's exactly what I did for this talk. I created my own B-Sides uh, Toronto 2020 um, feature movie and created a DCP out of it. So what is in the DCP for real? Um, picture, picture and audio, that's your media assets. And those are the MXF files. Um, but you'll also have other things. You'll have subtitles, you'll have fonts because you don't necessarily want to use the dorky projector default font you want, your cool font on screen. Um, there could be versioning, there could be versions of that movie, there could be subtitle language versions and some metadata about that content. There'd be metadata about the uh, composition and some of the things, including the security. Yes, there's security in the DCP, and yes, it is optional. You don't have to secure and encrypt DCPs, but um, for the kind of asset values we're talking about, you are. So in terms of the metadata, the XML, all the various things on these drives, what is it? Well, the first thing is the composition playlist. And the best way to explain this is that you don't play a DCP. You, you distribute and install and ingest a DCP contents, but you are playing from the composition playlist. This is the place that a theater would generate their show playlist from. And it includes a UUID that absolutely uniquely identifies that DCP. That's a very important thing. There's an RFC for it. Um, there's also a packing list. The packing list is going to contain all those MXFs, the sound, your audio, um, all those are going to be in that packing list and they are assigned. They are base 64 encoded MXF hashes. So that scene with Tyler, Tyler Durden just puts in the one uh, frame of film, not so much with this. Every one of those files is hashed and encrypted. So in terms of the rest of the drive, you'll have a volume index and asset map just to show you the structure and give you some information about that particular DCP drive. So this is a lot in terms of format. Who's, who, you know, who's responsible for setting this up? Well, DCP does predate DCI, but Digital Cinema Initiatives is basically the industry consortium that is currently running the D-Cinema specification. Uh, the best way to describe them would be it's where the film production world and all the production houses and meet the equipment world. So the Dolby's and the Doremi's and the Barco's and Christie. Um, there was very simple business goals in forming DCI and creating the digital cinema security model. Um, and the way it's done. In the DCI spec, about 40 to 50% of that spec is security. So that kind of speaks to some of their business goals and their mindset in designing this. And they had some good mindset um, in terms of open security architecture, in terms of making sure that um, they had rules in terms of how certificates and keys are generated. Uh, they wanted to make sure that there was going to be you know, some 
good sense of, of rigor. And that included up into um, our up in, in to including um, FIPS 140-3, or sorry, 140-2 certification um, of the media blocks, of the actual secure portion um, of the D-Cinema infrastructure. These could be a border, a module, or even a blade that goes right into a projector, or it could be a standalone device in a rack um, that talks to a media server, or it could be built into a media server potentially. So the media block is kind of the security processing brain of what we're talking about when we talk about the D-Cinema model. There's more specific, kind of specific words about these things, but for the, the purpose of this talk, I want to kind of just talk about media blocks. And in terms of the FIPS 140-2 level three physical security, what we're talking about is tamper resistance and tamper reactivity. Um, you can't just go into the non-serviceable parts of that board. It will zeroize keys, it will wipe CSPs, um, it will react to that attack. Uh, in terms of the, the chassis and enclosures and doors, um, projectors of this type don't play if the doors are open. Um, there's uh, switches and monitoring and audit of the physical chassis and everything is logged and those logs are signed. So this gives you a sense of the physical security that has to exist because these media blocks and these media servers are installed in theaters. Um, they are not necessarily, you know, uh, completely secure environments. They are managed environments, but um, DCI has to, due to the asset values, due to the business impact, um, take this to the next level and they have on the securing engineering and the hardware side. The big key thing to take away here is that there's a vendor install certificate, actually several certificates inside that media block. They're in secure silicon and they are protected in a non-serviceable uh, portion of that chassis that's monitored. So in terms of the cryptography that's on these boxes, um, you'll see here some of the usual cryptographic suspects. And here's what they're used for. So we have um, good old AES-128 CBC mode. Um, this is that picture in audio MXF, those wrappers. Um, this is how they're encrypting it. So that's your, your block cipher on all of that data. And you also have data links. It's possible if you have a media block that's um, standalone or rack mount, uh, you may have some media, uh, media or data links to the projector and you need to do AES across that. You can't just be talking to certain other pieces of gear in the clear. It's just not the level of security we're at with cinema at this level. Um, and also you have your certificates. You have your SHA-256, RSA-2048 uh, certificates. There's signing going on and there is some hashing. And here's one that's the interesting one is the SHA-1. There is SHA-1 happening here. Um, before you freak out, I would say do some research on both HMAC construction and how the um, optimal asymmetric encryption padding works um, and ask yourself just, you know, what is the collision resistance really demanded by these two functions? So I would check that first, but I will say there are there is some SHA-1 hashing happening in the security model. And I've looked at both um, interrupt and SMPTE DCPs uh, to validate this. So um, that is a, an interesting thing to note. So in terms of DCI and how these certificates get into hardware, well, here's the list. These are the only vendors that DCI allows to have a DCI recognized cert cut and installed from the manufacturer into the secure silicon on these media block devices. And you'll see here, you'll have Dolby, Doremi, you'll have some media server type companies, but you also have projector companies like Barco and Christie. Um, so they would be looking at media blocks that can maybe install as a blade or a module directly in a projector. But this is actually the entire list. It's a very small select group of companies that answer to a small consortium of production companies. And here's a good example of uh, a FIPS cert. This is a FIPS cert for the, um, the security uh, media block that would go into an IMS 3000. That's a Dolby media server. Um, so you can see here that they've actually exceeded the, the physical security. Uh, they're actually doing level three, but they're also doing level three FIPS at the design assurance and the authentication level. Cause there's actually a lot of role-based access, access control on these media servers. There's tends to be different accounts that could do certain things. You can't just show up as the person that does the show playlist and also necessarily change security settings. So you can see here that this is an officially certified item. And in fact, for a while, Dolby was fully FIPS certifying, fully level three, um, some of the products. So I think that's a really interesting data point about how far they're willing to go to meet and exceed the DCI standard. And this sort of level of security engineering we're talking about here. Uh, it's not everything in the entertainment world that gets built to this kind of spec. And here's a picture of a media block. This is a Dolby Cat uh, 745. You can see it's a rack mount kind of ruggedized looking box. And this is where that secure silicon that holds those uh, RSA keys is gonna live in a theater. And this would be an IMB um, 
screen certificate. This is the media block screen certificate. Um, screen certificate just means that this is the certificate that controls what that can send to the projector and actually display. And you can see it here represented in X509. They use a somewhat constrained version of X509 version three, but you can see here it identifies itself as a media block as CAT745 and spells out it's using RSA2048 and SHA256. Oh, sorry, SHA2256. Um, and this, that's about it. Basically, this certificate is used to properly get that AES key uh, to that media block encrypted and allow it to read the content at DCP. And then it can actually read it, either ingest it into the media server, and actually you can play media directly off the DCP in cases. So who wants to do this? Who is asking you for DCPs? Well, one place that they'll ask you for DCPs is film festivals. So here's Sundance 2020, and here's their instructions for how to get them DCPs. And you can see here, this is Con 2019, and this is Con 2020, the Marche de Film, and they're asking for DCPs and how to encrypt them. And what you're starting to see here from Sundance and here is they strongly recommend delivering non-encrypted DCPs. Um, that is not always possible. Um, there are some really big films that screen at these festivals that likely can't take those chances. In those cases, you see they're asking for something called a KDM. So what is a KDM? How does this, how does this interact with a, a DCP to get your film to con, which hopefully you want to do as a filmmaker? Um, it's a key delivery message. And the best way to describe this is this is the controlled distribution of the AES key to the endpoint, to the theater will be displayed. So that essence encryption for the MXFs in, in that DCP are going to be unlocked by this, this key, but it has to get there securely using RSA. It's also considered a simply extra theater message. And then the KDM is a message that leaves the theater uh, and it comes from outside the theater. Uh, they're always cut to a target certificate. So if you remember that picture, that Dolby 745, when I created the DCP for this presentation, I got a Dolby 745 certificate and I wrote my KDM to it. So I'm saying I'm targeting this particular, not even particular theater, particular screen in a particular part of that theater um, on my booking dates. And you can also do this with a trusted device list. Um, there are um, distributors that do nothing except um, keep lists of where your bookings will be, what screens they have, which media blocks they have. They will validate all that hardware is current and they will be able to generate KDMs for you. So you can imagine there's a lot of maintenance that goes into these lists, but that's part of the logistics, logistics of the security model. One of the big things the KDM does, other than getting that AS key there, is it determines a playout window. And this is when the movie can and can't screen. Um, it can only screen for a particular duration. Um, that is just part of what they do to control security and control bookings for you know, films of this level. And there's various ways to get these KDMs there. The, the one often used is just email. It's all public key cryptography, so they just email the XML over. Um, an aspect of this I want to get into very briefly is that you can get a distribution KDM. When you're submitting to these film festivals, um, they often might not know which screen you're projecting on just yet. So they need the ability to cut KDMs on your behalf for their media blocks. So you can cut them a distribution version of KDM that uses the exact same format that'll allow them to do that. And finally, for um, anyone using encrypted DCPs, um, there's a few um, I think four or five situations where a DCP will not screen a movie. And one of them is you have not ingested a valid KDM. If that's encrypted, there's no KDM, the show does not go on. So I don't expect you to actually read this screen, but this is the entirety of a KDM, a key delivery message. And I can zoom in here a little bit. You can see it identifies itself. It's got that RFC UUID at the top. It uh, identifies itself as the B-Sides Toronto 2020 feature film um, and the issue date of the KDM and gives you the information of where this KDM came from. This is the interesting part. This is the crucial part of the KDM that determines the dates where the movie is actually going to screen. And when I say crucial, I mean, when you go to author a KDM, this is literally the first thing that asks you is, is when is the movie screening and for how long? Um, so we, I, what you can see here is that for the besides Toronto 2020 movie, I have cut the, um, the play out window to be valid for the duration of this talk. So from one to 140 today, you can play this movie. Um, and you can see again, it's cut for Adobe Cat 745 of that particular serial number. And right here at the top, here are your AES keys. So my movie had um, one MXF for picture and one MXF for audio. You can see here this KDM is carrying two AES keys to that theater for those two MXFs. So what this means is when you have a DCP, you're gonna have MXFs that are individually AES encrypted 
And then the composition playlist, the packing list, and the KDM are all signed. So in terms of trying to alter any of this stuff, it's not going to happen. Um, all of these things are interleaved just so and are signed and validated to prevent you from doing that. And in terms of um, changing those MXFs or doing anything to them, uh, this is designed to not let you do that. So here's the question. I just basically fire hosed you with DCP um, breakdowns in, in design. Um, how secure is this? How secure is this model? Um, my take is that there's no widespread sense that the inherent model um, that's, that's operated by DCI um, has been broken in any way. Uh, I don't get that sense at all from what I've done to uh, research for this talk, but there have been some different rumors and I wanna express them and I do that carefully as I can. So uh, in 2016, there was a rumor that a 4K version of the Hateful Eight had been leaked and it, it was leaked. Um, and the people that leaked it were kind of running their mouth a bit about cracking DCP to get it. Um, this obviously caused a lot of concern in the industry given how much has gone into this model, you can see. Um, but it doesn't seem to be the case. And, and the main thing is that there just hasn't really been a pattern of leaks since then. Um, generally speaking, in talking with private, um, sorry, piracy um, analysts that have talked about in, in, in the industry, um, there's a trickle in a flood pattern where if you have a true break and a true leak, and you can look back and see this pattern, um, you'll see a big feature, nothing a big feature, nothing. Um, and then you'll see 20 titles. And that didn't happen after 2016. Um, what happened is this one thing happened and there hasn't been a lot of sense. Um, so that, that seems that rumor was probably not true. The next rumor is concerning. It was, it was, it's about something called ghost one or ghost number one. Um, this is a story that came out of China about mid last year about a series one pre-DCI rumored projector that someone had cloned a valid RSA key pair into. Um, obviously, the, being a Series 1 older model, it doesn't have the non-serviceable um, secure silicon, all that stuff in it. Um, but the point is that, uh, and this is conjecture, is like, this is, has been reported, this has been written up, but I don't want to, I don't want to convey it in any other sense than um, I've heard this and I need to share it. Um, but the idea is that they had a ring of people that could supply them with valid DCPs. Um, and they built this into quite a little uh, enterprise and they actually had to use physical intrusion to obtain those keys. So I'm presenting this to this audience as sort of unconfirmed information. I encourage you to research this if you're interested in it. I'm gonna continue researching it myself, but it's something that um, really points out that supply chain security and we're back to trust. Um, these vendors have a responsibility to adhere to the DCI spec and there's rules of what they can and can't do with these certs and what they can't retain from certs they have in the field. That was a rule that changed um, a few years back. Um, and so we need to make sure, that, make sure that the supply chain manufacturer side is gonna be there to back this up. It also means that the standards bodies behind these standards need to stay relevant and engaged. Um, they have to make sure that those relationships with those vendors are intact um, so they can play the role they need to play to make sure that supply chain question is being addressed. But I think rumors aside, um, given the business goals that DCI had, they were very simple. Um, you know, Make sure that we know where a movie's gonna play, the movie plays where it's supposed to play, when it's supposed to play, and you know, protect a certain business case that they had. And given the business goals, and given the fact that as a, as a design level consideration, they wanted to make sure they didn't need um, IT people to do this in theaters. They want this something that could be done as a day-to-day -day business. They didn't want to have something elaborate. Um, the level of security they've managed to build out and the level of hardware security and the buy-in they've got from vendors, um, given those business goals, this is actually tremendous. I think that DCI has done something really spectacular. And I think it's something that other um, parts of industry and those of us in InfoSec um, can take away in terms of how to build systems that incorporate trust, hardware, and how to solve something where the asset values have really, really climbed. Some observations, however, and I've, I've carefully titled this slide observations. Um, there's things I've noticed going through these things and looking at DCPs and the specs. Um, and one is that the DCI spec has a lot of controls and caveats about um, key generation uh, for those RSA certs, um, use of a secure DRBG, um, storage and handling. On the vendor side, on the equipment side, there's a lot of those rules. I haven't come across a whole lot yet about the DCP authoring side. And when I was, you know, 
cutting DCPs and KDMs in terms of the AES key generation, or you know, we're we're using CBC mode. I didn't get any pop up about random versus fixed IVs. I didn't I didn't see anything like that. And I can tell you right now that when I did author this DCP, it dumped that AES key in the clear to an XML file in my working directory. Um, good enough for my you know film school grad project? Yes. Good enough for Avengers Endgame? No. Um, and this is the hard truth of it, is that because the cinema scene, amateur film, creator culture has expanded so much, there's been a, a tremendous growing demand to supply DCP authoring tools to a broader community. That's great, that's awesome. Um, the hard truth is that some of these DCP authoring tools have a hard time authoring DCPs that work. As a security person, I have a hard time making a leap that those same tools are also flawlessly doing um, AES key generation, key handling, key storage, all this stuff um, flawlessly on the DCP authoring side. And I say that partly because of the, the clear text AES key. Um, would a cinema grade professional DCP authoring suite, mastering suite, use an, a properly encrypted key store? Probably, yes. I, and that's my understanding that they do. But I think this bears some, some study and, and some further questions. Um, and especially when the SMPTE standard standard for MXF essence encryption has an abstract that reads, we don't specify how you manage your cryptographic keys in the standard. You know, we, we will create a syntax and then, you know, design for it. Um, but this kind of doubles the curiosity of this question. Uh, in the DCI spec itself, there's a lot of TLS mentioned. Um, TLS is not necessary to use in a cinema environment, but there could be times when you're using it. Um, there could be things where you have TLS happening over certain kinds of links or networks. Uh, you may have a NAS, Dolby sell, um, sells a NAS with Dolby firmware on it. Um, it's a QNAP with Dolby firmware. Um, there's different things where there could be TLS happening. Um, they're very clear in TLS versions, they are not clear in TLS cipher suites. And this is interesting because they're all over the FIPS 140-2 and now 140-3 certifications. Um, but there's a lot of non-FIPS ciphers in the cipher suites for TLS 1.3. So this, this struck me as a little odd in terms of not constraining or recommending cipher suites um, in these environments. There's also the fact that MXF is a wrapper. It's an encapsulation format. Right in the, the 2006 RFC for MXF, there was a warning that someone could wrap executable code uh, in the MXF format. And if you were to trust that, uh, you might experience a denial of service. Um, I'm sure the people at this conference can think of way more interesting things we could do with MXF if we could convince people in these environments to run stuff as executables from them. Um, I am not convinced that a warning in RFC addresses this, and I think that we're in a different world now from when this may have been um, considered. Um, so I think that in terms of the uh, resilience of authoring suites and equipment, um, I would look into this. There's also uh, in the media block and sort of the, the media server world, um, there's a whole lot of auto scanning and auto discovery going on in, in some of this equipment. And if you look at how incredibly secure uh, and buttoned down the media blocks are, this struck me as a little strange to see the amount of auto detection and auto discovery going on that and I would assume is going on securely and with good design, but it, it's a lot. And finally, satellite distribution. Um, DCPs, like I said, are usually physically taken to a theater. Um, they can be distributed by satellite. Um, unfortunately, um, we're in a different world now. This is a now versus then thing. Uh, and when I say then, I mean, I've seen diagrams of cinema networks where there's firewalls in front of all the scary internet stuff and nothing in front of the satellite link. And if you look at um, James Paver's talks from Black Hat or DEF CON this year, um, I think they're very eye-opening in terms of the current state of the art in amateur satellite intercepts and what can and can't be done. Um, the Aerospace Village has some fascinating talks on this topic and I think this is an area to look at. So in terms of other areas that are following suite, other industries that may have taken some you know, lessons from this already, um, I think it's likely that's happened. I think a really good example is likely the Xbox One came out in 2013. Um, Tony Chen gave a fantastic talk at the uh, Platform Security Summit in Redmond last year about what actually went into the design, the hardware design of the Xbox One. And it was jaw dropping. Um, much like DCI, they had extremely simple business goals. We don't want pe people cheating on Xbox Live. We don't want people stealing and selling games. The, their list of, of business goals is very simple. And they took that and ran with it. And what they designed, is bananas. Um, it is a custom system on chip. There is literally nothing in the clear outside that system on chip. That system on chip 
a chip actively assumes every piece of hardware in the box is trying to attack it and defeat it. Um, they are monitoring for voltage, side channel attacks, environmental. This is almost FIPS level four stuff in an Xbox. Um, and it's all hypervisor based. It's all multiple operating systems. And there's successive levels of encryption, decryption, and signing that happen in hashing within this device that make it, um, in Tony Chen's words, utterly miserable for attackers. And the thing that really impressed me about this is that they're really leveraging the manufacturer, the, the build time of the devices to make sure they can, you know, much like DCI, get trusted, protected certs on those devices and actually properly bury them and properly protect them and do proper, you know, hard resets on cold boots. Like they've really taken it to that level. And what I would love to be able to do is I'd love to be able to go back in time and tell someone from the 90s, you know, uh, by the way, the, you know, you've seen the new memory management for Trusted Solaris, they really started using the features from the Game Boy to secure that, because that's where we're at. The hypervisor security in Xbox One has trickled into the Windows server ecosystem, which is one of the most mind-blowing things. And if, if, if you can take anything from this talk um, in terms of where we are at in trust in hardware security and security engineering, that one's awesome. And I think this is the sort of thing where, uh, in my perspective, um, I see the lessons of DCI showing up in other fields now, like the Xbox uh, Xbox One. Um, and finally, there's also a format called IMF. This is the, uh, the interoperable uh, master format. And uh, this is something that SIM dealer groups are working on. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because you may have noticed I have not mentioned Netflix or VOD yet. That's because they don't use DCPs. They use something called IMF. And IMF is something that's coming to the fore. It offers a lot of different pluses over DCP, it's directly derived from it. But if you think about how, how Netflix and VOD works, like their versioning requirements are very intense. They are localizing heavily. They have a lot of other content they need to display. Um, so IMF is geared to their needs. And I think they're on a similar security journey right now with IMF. And I'd be very fascinated to see where that goes. And I'd love to see a talk on this if anyone's curious. So here's the next chapter for digital cinema. Um, quantum computing. And I think that we're all more aware of quantum computing now, you know, leveraging quantum mechanics to vastly increase our ability to process information. Um, vast improvements in some kinds of math and problems, not all of them, but some, and some of them are cryptographically relevant. Um, I think that the threat to public key crypto systems is much more widely understood now. I think that's much more in the public consciousness. When I was going to some things back in conferences in 2014, um, I didn't see that as much now, but I think that is being discussed more widely. And if you're hearing talk about crypto agility, um, a lot of this is about this topic in terms of being able to move faster. And if you were at a shop that um, took a lot of time with TLS 1.2, or if you were you know, struggling with SHA-1 certs, or you had a hard time with heart bleed, um, you know what a lack of agility feels like in the cryptographic space. And this is a significantly more difficult problem. So people really are talking about how to do this. Um, but work is taking place in key sectors. People are really trying to, um, you know, do the work to, to solve these problems and the solutions are coming. So in terms of the implications for digital cinema on the quantum side, I think number one, the significant impact to RSA 2048. Um, RSA 2048 has become the target of choice for quantum prognostication when it comes to cryptographic breaks. Um, so I think that the, the, the hard truth is that the digital cinema industry is going to have to wrestle with RSA 2048 in light of what is likely coming. Um, are there some impacts to their other constructions? Yes, um, they are at sort of the, the line in terms of AES security strength, um, but I'm not sure it's, it's what people were afraid of. Um, people said in the early days, it was being a, a clean 50% break, you're gonna lose 50% of your AES security strength. Um, I've seen studies since then that say, you know, it's maybe not quite half, it's closer to half than we'd like, um, but it's not quite half. Um, but I think there will be some impact um, and there'll be some discussion about this other algorithms and constructions they're using. There's also implications even after um, post-quantum algorithms come into the play and we have quantum safe systems. Um, number one being, uh, these are very high asset value systems. They are protecting against a much wider range of physical attack than um, some industries might be looking at. Um, and they're also looking at FIPS 140-3, which expands the definitions of um, non-invasive attacks. So in terms of side channel resistance, um, if any of you have reviewed the, the NIST finalist report for the, the, the post-quantum algorithms, um, there is not uniform, great, exciting side channel resistance yet in some or many of these. Um, this will be something to look at 
when we're talking about the security space and the security problem. But there's also some things I think that might be not so bad for the film industry. Uh, number one, we're not talking about constrained devices. We're talking about big rack mount, you know, blades and, and modules. So they're not talking about constrained devices um, in terms of when, you know, how often keying happens um, and how real time it is. Um, the public key size question has always uh, been an issue in the post quantum space, but the size of public keys. Um, and the good news is that I don't think this is going to hurt them as badly as it will hurt some kinds of transactions. Um, and second, and this seems to be, seems to be uh, looking at structured lattices for some of the um, first moves in this space. And they kind of hit the middle of the road on those key sizes. So I'm not sure that digital cinema is going to be hit too hard by some of these downsides or some of these potential concerns. And the final thing is that the design of DCPs and, and the KDM and, and the way they've, they've built everything uh, is modular enough. I think that if they have to go to a hybrid approach, um, that will be pretty easy to take with this. Uh, I think that they have enough to work with. They could use the modularity they have and look at a hybrid approach in the interim. So in terms of the timeline, how soon they may be looking at this, um, given they're based on RSA 2048. So Dr. Michele Mosca, he's the co-founder of the Institute for Quantum Computing in Waterloo. And he has this particular stat he loves to bring up, which is his chances of an RSA break. And he's updated this several times. He did this recently, it's November 2019 in Seattle. Um, he has pulled dozens of researchers. When I mean researchers, I mean the people doing the real deal work in the quantum computing space, in the labs, um, looking at the peer reviewed stuff. They see the funding, they know who's doing which work. He pulls them. And his new pr uh, prediction is a one in five chance by the end of this decade of an RSA 2048 break. And when he means a break, he means 24 hours. So that sometimes seems to some people like a good window, but I want to break this down how it's maybe not a good window. So let's say best case, NIST has the finalists approved and standardized in 2022 um, at, the, at the earliest. Um, okay, great. That goes to the manufacturers. They start building to the spec. They have to FIPS certify anything that comes out of the spec using those algorithms against FIPS 140-3, um, including the expanded non-evasive attacks. Um, then it has to actually hit the market. Then you need to procure it, buy it, deploy it, get it installed, test it, and then run it. And that might be anywhere from a year to two or three. So that 2030 date starts to get nearer and nearer when you actually go through the gymnastics of the approval, standardization, validation, certification, market process. Um, and I want to caution people about their optimism about how fast these dates can creep up because we've seen less difficult Cryptographic problems take more time. So are changes coming? Uh, is digital cinema gonna have to make some literal quantum shifts? Um, in my estimation, absolutely. Um, they are at the, you know, outside of some of their security strength um, when it comes to what they're working with right now. It's fantastic what they built. I think it's actually really commendable, but should these things come to pass, changes are gonna to have to happen. And I think DCI is just showing too much focus to miss this. Um, I really have to, to shout them out because um, DCI was warning their consortium members, their vendors about FIPS 140-3 transition back in 2010. They're all over this stuff. I've seen national governments pay less attention to FIPS standards than DCI does. Um, so they're, they're really good. And they also, they also understand security that right in the spec, they're talking about the dynamic nature of security and technology uh, means that changes and in, in evolutions will have to happen. And they are always amending these specs. So they get it. And I think their, their focus is too good to miss this and not move. That said, it was SIMPTI, the um, Society of Motion Picture Television Engineers. Um, SIMPTI was the one that moved to the DC, DCP spec that included subtitles in the encryption. Um, and I think there's good reasons for that. I think that I, I wanna say that I think SIMPTI in, in terms of encrypting subtitles um, may have been a good move. Cause if you think of someone had lost just the subtitles to end game, like holy spoilers guys. Um, I, I see that move as being indicating that SIMPTI is evaluating the security question uh, in the impact. So we'll see what happens, but there's movements happening here, especially the small shifts that already happened, like TLS 1.3 now being the DCI spec, um, things like FIPS 140-3 being called out very early on and now recommended as the testing regime for the vendors. Um, and just the fact that the assets values are there, we're dealing with a, a security problem space where this question has to come up. Um, but the good things are the solutions are in progress and there's positive indications that the industry can actually make the leaps. 
And I say that because I think that the film industry may be uniquely suited to take this challenge on. Um, for one, they tend to push technology. They're bullish on technology. You know, it never renders quick enough. The machine's never fast enough. There's never enough dry space. Um, that's, that's film. And I think that these standards bodies can play a crucial role in capturing that momentum and that energy and that interest in technology and steering it in, in the future evolution of their security. Um, and they also do already doing some of the work. I mean, Simti does have working groups that occasionally will look into potential vulnerabilities. DCI has already demonstrated they can roll at the times and get TLS 1.3 in place, warn people of what's coming. Um, and they've built a really impressive system. So. I think they have the chops. I mean, even in the DCI spec right here, um, they're basically describing crypto agility in this quote. So I think that uh, between this and initiatives like the Trusted Part Network, where it's just like MPA and the TV and the streaming industry is all putting their security audit eggs in one basket, putting more eyes on the problem. I think all these things actually bode really well. And I think the film industry has an amazing opportunity right now and the skills and the, the culture um, to be almost uniquely suited to surmount this. And this is a metaphor actually about why I think um, they're so suited. This is a DCP kit. This is a DCP kit number one from Crew. Crew drives used to just go in a Pelican case. But if you've ever opened a Pelican case and had to almost take your fingers off with those latches, you know it is not the most user-friendly experience. And if you zoom in on this, you will see these nice soft thumb levers on the crew drive case. So not only is this a more user-friendly design, but it's also half the depth of some of the Pelican cases. And there's reasons for this because the, the the major th security threat facing this crew this DCP this screw drive is not falling off the side of a boat in an ocean it's drops this is a purpose designed drop test box that was drop tested above and beyond the usual for the express purpose of meeting the security and reliability needs of the screw drive and this DCP so I think this is the perfect metaphor to show how um, film knows its problems um, can evolve and improve on products um, can work with vendors and come up with good solutions that more uh, truly meet the security needs and improve along the way. So I hope what you get at this talk is just that in terms of high asset value questions of trust, where we need to start looking at security engineering and maybe even hardware, I think there are serious lessons learned and a lot of um, uh, blood, sweat and tears that went into what DCI has accomplished here and what the DC cinema model has, um, has accomplished for security. I'd love to take some questions. Absolutely. Thank you for that talk. Uh, very comprehensive as the people are saying. So it was well received. Um, first question is, uh, what does the staff at the movie theater need to do to play the movie? Is it um, very complicated? It, how, where is the pre setup for making the encryption work and who's responsible for that? So because the certificates already installed on the media block, what you do is you just take that DCP drive you receive, take it out of the case, and there'll be a slot, an adjust slot that's in the media server. You slap that drive in like an irremovable drive and hit ingest and it pulls that CPL out and it will want that KDM. So what you'll have by that point is those email KDMs using a thumb drive. You'll put the thumb drive in, ingest KDM, and it'll show your playlist. It'll be like KDM ding. That's pretty much it. It's considered to be uh, a problem they wanted to solve without going to technical lengths. And the media servers are all optimized and have great UIs to help you do this. Cool. Uh, thanks. There's also another question um, slightly differently. So is there a performance impact based on all the encryption? And is it used for a kind of shuttling between places uh, such as for performing animation and CGI as well? Um, so it is possible to edit DCPs, but generally uh, if you're still in the post-production process, if you're still doing that sort of thing, you're not there yet, you're using different formats. So I would say mm -hmm. that this is unlikely to be the format that would use there. Um, and to the, the, the previous part of the question, um, can you just repeat that actually? Sorry, it was um, well, the encryption. about the performance impact. Yeah. Well, they're using AES. And as far as I know, these media servers are built using commodity hardware. So they would benefit from AES hardware acceleration, the CPU. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as far as I know, I don't think there's performance hit. Um, they're designed to be able to read the movie and project it straight off the DCP. So if there was a serious bottlenecks or serious encryption problems, I don't think that would even be feasible, but it is feasible. Okay, great. 
Um, thanks. And last question that we'll field here before heading to the channel is, uh, is this done across the world? And the question is really based around the fact that uh, there's encryption exportation limitations yep. between countries. So this talk is heavily North American based in terms of my understanding. However, obviously the international film festivals are asking for and receiving DCPs. I'm not sure how encryption export controls tie in this to be perfectly honest. Um, and I've also noticed that the EU countries tend to have different different distribution models and different distributors that handle this stuff. So I would say to, to err on the side of caution, interpret this talk as North America. And uh, I, I plan in the future to look into what's being done elsewhere. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the great, informative, in-depth talk. Thanks so much. And I'll be on the Discord. Feel free to drop me a line there or on Twitter.